telescope, um, which will launch later this year and will change our understanding of the universe. We will present three topics and each topic will be followed by a scientific demonstration and hands-on activity. We would love to have you participate in these activities right from your home as well. If you want to participate, you will need the following item. A few sheets of paper, printer paper or line paper will work perfectly. Two balls that can bounce like a tennis ball and a ping pong ball and one remote control like which you turn on your TV on and off. Those materials are listed in the chat as well. And we'll be letting you know when it's time to use them. Please post your questions and comments in the chat or the Q&A so, so we're excited to hear from you. If you need to leave early, we understand. You can always watch the recording of tomorrow's, today's event on LPI's YouTube channel. The link also will be in the chat. Our first speaker will be Andy Shainer. Andy is the Senior Education Specialist at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. And he's going to introduce us the telescope and help us understand what's so special about the James Webb Telescope. All right, thank you, Sherelle, and hello, everybody. <clears throat> I, I too am sitting in Houston. <laughs> um, so let, let's, without all uh, further ado, let me get the slide. Um, I guess share first. Okay, so I'm trusting you can all see my first slide there. Uh, so like- And did sure we see you in preview mode? Can you go ahead and yes. switch, switch mode? I was gonna say that as well. Thank you, Christine. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so like Cheryl said, I'm gonna uh, just I'm gonna give you a, a quick introduction into the uh, Webb Telescope today, uh, and a little bit about telescopes in general. Uh, for those of you who may not be too familiar with uh, how they how they work, so to speak. Um, so let's take a, let's put up our first poll question um, or uh, my first poll question uh, anyway, uh, and that question is: Have you have have you ever seen or even looked through? Uh, a telescope. Uh, so feel free to, uh, you can click more than one if you want to. If you've seen and looked through one, you can click both of those. Very simple question. Have you seen or even looked through a telescope? I'll be interested to see what folks have to say with this one. And Mason says that that he has, um, I was wondering for our host families if maybe maybe could, could they tell us if they've seen or looked through a telescope before? So Crystal did say that she did. She has looked through one? Yes. Oh, and they say they also own one. They have looked through one oh. and they also own one. <laughs> maybe that should have been an option is do you own a telescope? <laughs> All right, well, let's take a look at our poll results, see what, we, what, the, what we got here. So, all right, just about everybody has looked through a telescope. All right, that's great. Good, very good. Um, okay, thank you for that. Let's move on, maybe. There, all right. So there are all kinds of telescopes and they come in all kinds of sizes. Um, there, that on the, the picture on the left with the red and blue, those are more what you might consider a backyard kind of telescope that a lot of pe people who own telescopes in their home uh, probably have something like this. These are actually bigger than my own telescope, uh, to, to be honest. Uh, but those are probably what most people are familiar with, probably what most people have actually looked through uh, if they've been able to do that. Um, yeah, they're in the middle and the top. That's a very large research grade uh, telescope. It's actually in Wisconsin, I believe. It's Yerkes. Is that that's right, Christine? Right, Yerkes is in Wisconsin. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's a very large telescope. Um, and uh, those are both telescopes that you can you know you you can see. You look through you look through the lens or or the light comes through it and goes into a computer and you can see through it. There are two examples we have on there are telescopes that don't look, that don't 
observe that kind of light that we can see. Uh, so some telescopes are made to collect the light that we can see. Uh, some are made to collect radio waves. Uh, some are even made to collect uh, infrared or IR, which we typically, um, IR, we, uh, we feel as heat, um, as heat, or we call it infrared. Um, micro electromagnetic radiation. And that's actually pretty uh, important for today because the James Webb Space Telescope actually, that's its main purpose is to observe uh, infrared light. Uh, so that blue uh, backyard telescope in that picture, that's probably something like three feet long, about a yard long. Uh, whereas the white telescope there in the middle, the, uh, the Yerkes Observatory, that's about 60 feet long. That's a very, very, very large telescope. Uh, some, some telescopes use mirrors to help collect and focus the light to an eyepiece. Uh, some use lenses, some use both, uh, a combination of them. And like we see in this picture, some don't use lenses or mirrors. They, they, they're, just, they're just big dishes that uh, help to collect the, whatever type of radiation or whatever type of light it is that it's meant uh, to detect. Okay, but no matter how they're built or what they're made to detect, all telescopes have at least one thing in common. Uh, so I just wanted to point out, um, okay. So they're all made to collect light. So whether that's light that, you could, that we can see, that we see has color, uh, or it's like I said, it's microwaves, or it's uh, radio waves, or infrared radiation, they're all made to collect light. Um, and when we are pointing our telescopes at a star or a galaxy, the light that we get from those objects tells us a lot about them, a lot about them. Uh, without even having to go visit or take a piece of the star or the galaxy, we can learn so much just by the light that comes from it. Now, in general, the bigger a telescope or the bigger the opening uh, at the top of it, uh, or the bigger the mirror that it uses, uh, the more light it can collect from the object that it's pointed at. So for example, in, in our blue telescope there, the top of that, that opening is about six inches. The top, the opening of the big white telescope, that top is about 40 inches wide, that opening. That's well over three feet. So the, the width of the, the size of the opening of that white telescope is actually bigger than the length of that blue telescope we see there. It's just hard to tell. From, from the angle that picture was taken. But that's a very, very big telescope. And there are telescopes bigger than that with larger openings than that. So in general, the more light we can collect, the, the bigger the opening of a telescope or the mirror, the more light we can collect. So you can kind of think about, and, and that's important because the more light that you can collect, especially with, for objects that are very, very, very distant out in space, um, the brighter we can, they'll appear and the, or the more information we can get from them, which is really important. So in a way you can kind of think of telescopes as a, as a light bucket. It's, it's a, a bucket that's meant to catch light. So the bigger it is, the more it can catch. So another poll question here. So if these two weird looking buckets almost look more like funnels and they do buckets, but if these are, if these are two buckets uh, meant to collect light, which one? Would, would be able to collect more? Would bucket A be able to collect more light from space or would bucket B be able to catch more light from space? And this is a very, very crude, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I think we'd love to hear from our host families what they think as well. They want to unmute. Yeah, so what do, you, what do you think, A or B? Which one would be able to collect more light from space? Okay, B. B, okay. And looking at our poll, that's what everybody seems to believe. Everybody else is in agreement with you uh, on that one. Yes, B. So if these were two openings, two telescopes, telescope B would certainly collect uh, more light. Okay, B, <laughs> just to reinforce, B. Okay, uh, so here's 
example of why have, of how collecting more light can make a difference. So in the picture on the left, you see a picture of an object called the ring nebula, kind of obviously why it's called the ring nebula, taken from a backyard telescope. So relatively small telescope, like the red or the blue one we saw in that picture. On the left, that's the exact same object taken with, the, taken with a telescope. Uh, it's actually at the Kitt Peak Observatory. It's on a, on a mountaintop in uh, Southern Arizona. Uh, that telescope is about 11 feet wide. So its main mirror that it uses to collect uh, light is 11 feet wide, okay? Much, much bigger than those backyard telescopes so it can collect more light and it looks better. Now the colors are a little different, but that, that, that gets into kind of, uh, filters and what exactly it is the astronomers are looking for. But you can definitely see more detail in this in this than you can in the backyard, in the backyard telescope. Um, but even these two telescopes, as cool as this is to see these objects like this um, with these telescopes, the backyard telescope and a mountaintop telescope both have one problem, the same problem. And that is that they're under the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and the Earth's atmosphere causes distortions and fuzziness, um, although it's in interesting to note that even our big telescopes on mountains, we've developed technologies that can actually almost, almost eliminate that, um, uh, that barrier. So, so it's, it helps kind of balance out the fuzziness caused by the atmosphere. But before that, uh, and even, even now, even with that technology, what if we just put telescopes in space? What if we didn't have to worry about the atmosphere? And that's what we've done uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, and others before it. Hubble wasn't the first space telescope. There, there were others. Uh, but we have. We have put telescopes in space to help see much clearer uh, without having to worry about the atmosphere being in the way. Uh, also, some wavelengths of light um, don't make it through the Earth's atmosphere. So if there's an object in space emitting um, X-rays, for example, it's very hard for X-rays to get through the Earth's atmosphere. So we need to put telescopes above the atmosphere in space to see an X-ray light, to see the objects that emit X-ray radiation. So Hubble is, is, is like a big version of, the, of a backyard telescope, really. Uh, there on the left side of it, where there's a flap that's, that's popped up and on top, that's where the light comes in to the telescope. And it has mirrors in there uh, to bounce the, the light around to get down to its electronics, uh, its cameras, all the instruments that it, that it uses. So that's Hubble. And we'll say a little bit more about Hubble in a, in a bit. Uh, so another comparison, the picture on the left is from the mountaintop telescope in Arizona, and that picture on the right is from Hubble. So it's, it's pretty comparable to the one you see from the mountaintop, but it's just a little more clear uh, than the, um, the one from the mountaintop, but a little bit better. And again, the colors are just variations and different kinds of filters that telescopes use, uh, depending on what the astronomer was looking for. And just for another, for comparison up in the upper right, that's the picture from the backyard telescope of the exact same object. All right, so Webb telescope looks very different than, than Hubble and it looks very different than our backyard telescopes, but it works the same. The idea is to have a big mirror, which it has here, that's like the gold colored honeycomb looking object there. It's a big mirror to collect a lot of light. In this case, it's gonna be collecting a lot of infrared radiation, infrared light uh, from stars and galaxies. And it collects it, uh, it, it, it bounces off the gold part. I'm not sure if you can see uh, my uh, mouse here, but um, it bounces off the gold part up into this black piece and back down through that hole there where the light then goes down below what we call the sun shield at the very bottom. And that's what they call the bus, which has ca cameras and spectrometers and all the different kinds of instruments that the, that the telescope uses that's going to get the scientists the information they're looking for. That sun shield, uh, that middle part there, which looks pink uh, in this illustration, the illustration on the right, it doesn't quite look so pink, but that's actually pretty cool. And that's a very unique thing to a uh, web. There's a lot of unique things about web. This is one of them. Um, the way Webb is gonna be out in space, that shield will always be between the mirror and the sun. So it protects the, um, 
the mirror from sunlight and helps keep things dark, uh, so to speak. Okay. Okay, so here's another poll question. Uh, this is this is a this is a picture or it's an illustration, so to speak, of uh, the Webb telescope on the left and the Hubble telescope on the right. So that's our next poll. Which telescope is bigger? Do you think is bigger, Webb or the Hubble? What do our families think? Which is bigger, Webb or Hubble? Web. Web? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes, web is bigger. And that's what all, everybody else online agrees with that too. Yes, so web, web is bigger in general. It's a bigger spacecraft. Um, but what's most, the, the more important thing about web is that the mirror is also much larger. Uh, than Hubble's mirror. So how much larger? Well, there's a, a graphic on the left to show you. Uh, there's a person standing next to the, what would be the Hubble mirror. So that's how big the mirror for Hubble is compared to a person. Um, and then next to the Hubble mirror tells you how big the James Webb mirror. And the James Webb mirror is actually several different mirrors that are put together in that, that honeycomb shape. So that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an easier way of making a very large mirror. Instead of making just one huge mirror, you make a bunch of smaller ones and put them together. Uh, and, it had, and it has the exact same effect, which is pretty cool. And uh, there on the right, that's a picture of the actual mirror uh, as it was being, after it was put together. And you can see right below it, you can see a couple of engineers. So there's, there gives you an idea of the size of the mirror and the size of, uh, of the telescope. Uh, in general, when when how when Webb has its its solar fan or its sun sh shield out, it's about the size of a tennis court, uh, whereas the Hubble Space Telescope is about the size of a school bus. So that's that's in, in rough terms of how big these telescopes are. Now, you could put a school bus on a tennis court, so that shows you that uh, that Webb is a little bigger uh, than the Hubble. All right. One more uh, poll question here for folks. Uh, this this diagram is not to scale, by the way. <laughs> I just try to, but I just want to get a, a, a basic point of understanding. At which point do you think will Webb orbit the Earth? So, do you think it'll orbit Earth pretty close to the Earth, or like really far away, or maybe somewhere in between, like the Moon? Maybe. I mean, what, what do you, where do you think? Uh, at which point? A, B, or C, really close to the Earth, far away from the Earth, or maybe just somewhere kind of in the middle. I'll admit this isn't the most uh, interesting question. It may even be a little confusing, but that's, it was very hard to do this to scale, to, really, uh, to be able to really appreciate the distance. All right, so in our polls, uh, one person thinks it'll be relatively close to the Earth. Uh, eight folks have said somewhere far, much farther away. And a few people said, no, oh, kind of somewhere in the middle. Uh, so it turns out that uh, Webb is actually going to be quite far away. Um, it's going to spark away from the Earth a little less than a million miles from the Earth. Uh, by comparison, the moon sits about 240,000 miles from the Earth. So it'll be roughly... Uh, four times the distance from the Earth that the moon is. So it's going to be way out there, way, way out there. Um, and actually, point A that I've gone there, that's about where Hubble orbits. So Hubble orbits about 250 miles above the, surf the surface of the Earth. So it's not very far, really, uh, compared, at least certainly compared to the moon and certainly compared to where uh, the Webb telescope will sit. So a little less than 100 million or 1 million miles. I believe it's, it's something like 930,000 miles away. That's a Andy, long just way. To make sure that no one's confused. It's also not orbiting the earth. It's orbiting the sun instead of the earth. 
Well, that's true. Yes, yes. At that distance, it's technically not even orbiting the Earth anymore, <laughs> and it's and it's at a point where like it won't even move, which is pretty cool. It just will sit there. Gravity is a funny thing. <laughs> All right, so that's a little bit about uh, the telescope uh, and its comparison to Hubble. Uh, real quick, there there are four what the what the what the uh, NASA calls science themes, uh, four ideas that that the James Webb Space Telescope is going to help uh, scientists with, and one is the early universe. So this is a really really weird thing to imagine, but when you're looking out into space, especially with a a telescope like Hubble, and especially even with like, like James with a Webb telescope, when you're looking into space, you're looking back in time. So, for example, in this picture that we see from the Hubble Space Telescope, just at about every point of light you see, and I apologize, it might be confusing with the background of my slide, but just within the picture that's within that yellow box, um, within that yellow box, every point of light you see is a galaxy. Uh, there's probably a few stars in there that are like closer to the telescope, but otherwise those are galaxies. Those are, and those are some of the galaxy, galaxies that formed as much as 10, maybe 10 billion years ago. So those are seeing those galaxies as they were 10 billion years ago, not today, but 10 billion years ago, because they're that far away. So looking in space, looking back at these that far and that far distance is like looking back in time. So Hubble saw some galaxies uh, that were about you know, 10 billion years old. Webb is going to look even farther than that. To, it's going to be able to see some of the first galaxies and stars that were created, that, that were formed. Uh, another big thing is, is how do galaxies change over time? Um, what we see is galaxies way, way long time ago, some of the first galaxies were very clumpy looking. They didn't have these really cool spiral pinwheel structures like you see in this picture. So why is that? How, how do galaxies change over time? Um, how do galaxies form? How do they have their, what gives them their shapes? What happens when they collide? We've, we have seen pictures of galaxies that actually collide with each other. And so what happens when, when they collide? That, that's, that's a question, an ongoing question. Uh, also, a question of um, the life cycle of stars. Okay, so in general, we understand that clouds form from these big clouds of gas and dust uh, out there in space. But what what is go what what actually happens to go from a cloud of gas and dust into a star? Okay, and we also notice a lot of stars tend to form in groups. Well, why do they form in groups and not by themselves? Uh, and related to that, how do solar systems form, like our, like our own solar system? How do you go from a star, but also having planets around that? Uh, and this picture here, uh, it shows you, um, on the left side, that's a Hubble, excuse me, that's a Hubble telescope image of a cloud of gas and dust. And you can see a few stars, and those stars are between the telescope and that cloud. But then the other image also from Hubble looks at it in with inf the infrared. And all of a sudden you can see a lot more stars that you couldn't see before because they were behind that cloud. Um, and whereas the light from the star, the light you see can't get through the cloud, that infrared stuff, that heat radiation can get through the cloud and infrared cameras can pick that up. And we'll actually show you a bit of a demonstration of that here in a little bit. Hey, and finally, other worlds. Okay, and the idea, how, how do planets come together? So we have an idea of what planets are made of, especially because of our own solar system. But what exactly goes on that makes those everything come together? Um, when planets form in these big disks of gas and dust, like in that illustration there, do they stay where they form? Or do they move closer to the star or farther away? Um, and how do big planets like Jupiter, for example, how does it affect small planets like Mars or the Earth as, you know, when, when these things are forming? All kinds of questions, um, all kinds of questions that are, we, scientists now are, are working on these questions, but the information we're gonna get from James Webb will help us a lot, give us more information uh, to be able to answer these, these questions. And one more thing, just one more cool thing about Webb. And that is, this thing is so big, you got you to put it on a rocket to get it into space. 
okay? But it's so big, it has to fold up. So there on the, on the left, that's an artist illustration of what web will look like when it's out in space and it's operating. But there on the right, that's what it looks like so we can get it on the rocket. And then once it gets into space and detaches from the rocket, it'll unfold, kind of like a transformer, which is, which is pretty cool. And that is a very technically challenging thing to do. This was a very big uh, challenge that engineers had to figure out. How do we fold this thing up so that it can unfold again and still work when it gets into space? So, all right, that's all I've got for you. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand it over to Grace to uh, do, an show you, do an activity with you uh, to kind of get to this idea of how web folds. Thanks, Andy. And actually, before you're off the hook, can we ask you two questions from the Q&A? Uh, sure. <laughs> OK, cool. So first off, Mark wants to know, um, when does the web become operational and start taking data? It's a good question. Um, so and it's not going to take too long to get to its location. Uh, um, I, th I know for sure they are expecting the first pictures to be back sometime in the spring, uh, March, April timeframe. Uh, so pretty, pretty quick. It's, it's not going to linger too long because it, it won't be launching until December. Um, so it's not going to be, it's not going to be uh, lounging around too long before it gets to work. One of the things I heard was um, in terms of the data collection that the scientists were going to get to celebrate the 4th of July for two reasons. One, because it's Independence Day in the U.S. and two, because that's about when they expect to be collecting data. So, yeah, hopefully first pictures in the springtime and first data for scientists in midsummer. So here in America, we can look forward to the 4th of July for those two reasons. Um, OK, so we also have a question. Um, oh, this one's for Sherelle. Sherelle, does your family have a relationship to the namesake of the telescope? You know what? Unfortunately, no. It is just <laughs> by coincidence that we're, ty we're talking about the James Webb Telescope, but my last name has absolutely nothing to do with it. So we are not <laughs> relatives. But if somebody else asks me that, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> it's no, fun, though, when we say we're doing all these events in honor of Webb. <laughs> and it's like, oh, you know, we won't specify. Maybe it's the telescope. Maybe it's our awesome colleague. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Um, OK, and then we'll do this one more question, and then we'll do our first activity. Um, Ariella wants to know, is there a risk of that thin metallic material tearing i don't know <laughs> it's a great it's a good question right it's a it's a good question and oh my gosh I, it, it's it totally makes sense I, I i suppose there is but it's i honestly don't even know how thin or thick it is um I, i'm sure i'm um, this was something I was curious about. So I, I looked at the frequently asked questions. Um, mm. And one of the one of the things they said was that they installed all of those really thin sheets with something called tear guards, which means that if like a micrometeorite punctures it, it might make a little hole, but there are all of these reinforced seams that will keep that hole from spreading. So in other words, it could puncture little holes that might happen, but it won't be able to spread and tear that whole material. So that's a good thing, but it is very delicate material yeah. for sure. And fortunately, there are people much smarter than me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, work, <laughs> that worked on that. Okay. So I am going to take you guys through an activity where we're going to be doing some origami. So. I hope you have a sheet of paper and this can just be regular old printer paper or lined paper like from a journal, but we're gonna be making two things. Yay, okay, cool. I see our host families have some paper, awesome. So first we're gonna make a hexagon, okay? It looks like a little pita pocket. Um, the hexagon is the shape of all of those James Webb mirrors, right? And when you're done, 
You can decorate it, do cool stuff with it. You could make a bunch of them and make up the whole mosaic. And then the second shape we're gonna do is a rocket. Okay, and same thing, after we're done, you can decorate your rocket, make it pretty fun, and you can maybe play with it tomorrow for Halloween. Okay, so give me one moment. I'm gonna set up over here. So let me, all right. Can you see this okay? Yes, Grace, we see you fine, thank you. And you can hear me? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. So we have a sheet of paper. The first thing that we're gonna do is fold it in half hot dog style. Okay. If you're following along at home, I'll try to go slow, but I'll also put the directions in the chat afterward to a website that'll repeat all these steps. So we fold it in half. Great. And then we're going to unfold it. We have that crease down the middle and we're going to flip it over. Okay. So now we have a little ridge up the top. Now we're going to do two more folds. And we're going to fold up and to the center. Oh, I, oh. Grace, we can't see your video anymore. Um, okay. I disagree. I see her video just fine. Well, here, let me just um, switch which one I'm talking through. Give me one second, and that should help. Oh, you know what the problem is, is that um, it's we're not um, spotlighting. Let me spotlight your, your phone video. Sorry, we'll do that. Oh, I'm sorry. I had done that. I, I thought I had done that. No, you're spotlight okay. now, so everyone should be able to see you now. Okay, cool. So sorry, sorry, those of you, technical difficulties. So we folded the paper in half, hot dog style, and then we unfolded it and we flipped it over so that our crease is now facing up. Next, we're gonna make two more folds. We're gonna bring the edges of the paper to that center seam and then fold them down. Okay, so we did it on the right side. We're gonna repeat on the left side. All right, so if we unfolded it, this is what it looks like, All right? So again, we want this center seam to be sitting up and then we have two little valleys on the sides. Okay, cool. So next we're gonna fold the left wing down. We're gonna keep this one down and um, we will fold this corner, the bottom left corner, we're gonna fold it up so that it lines up with the middle seam of the paper, okay? But we're gonna stop the fold at this bottom corner. So let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna fold up like this. So see how I'm bringing a triangle up, but I'm not letting it go any further than this seam on the right. And I'll fold it down. So I folded the left corner up to the central seam, but the fold should stop at this right crease. Everybody good? It's quiet, I see nothing in the chat. That means people are working hard. Okay. So the next thing we're gonna do, it's gonna look like a hexagon soon, I promise. There's, it's hard to see it, but on your paper, you should see this little crease right here. That's your guideline for the next fold. So you're gonna take that crease and you're gonna fold the paper this way. And then flatten it out. Okay, so I can show you again. There is a crease right here. This wing is still open and we fold it up. Okay. So we now have the bottom of the hexagon right here. It's gonna come out in just a second. So now the next step's real easy. We have this right wing. We're just gonna fold it in and flatten it down. 
All right, so our hexagon is coming into appearance. Here we go. Oh, mine got a little messed up. Okay. The next fold, you're going to take this whole top part and you're going to take this edge and line it up with this fold over here. Okay, so you're gonna fold across like this. See that? And line it up. And then we'll flatten it out. All right, coming along. So next we have, let me see how the light looks. You should have a crease up here. Oh, looking good. Looking good, Jimmy. So you should have a crease up here and we're gonna fold that down. See that? So you'll fold it down and we are almost there. Okay, now we just have this little piece that's sticking out. And you can see on the front of your hexagon, the line that you need to, to fold parallel to. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna fold this little flap back so that it hides behind the front of the hexagon. Okay, so this is, this is what we have. Now to get rid of this little flap, you're gonna tuck it into the pocket. You've made a pocket of paper. So we have this flap here. You'll kind of lift up the hexagon parts you've made, right? And then over here, there's this fold. See that? And you can kind of tuck your paper into that little pocket, flatten everything down, and you've made yourself a hexagon. Oh, it looks awesome. I see Sherelle's. I see Jimmy's. Great work. If you want to share these with us online, we would love to see them. We'll post in the chat how you can share with us through Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. Um, but you could make a bunch of these and decorate them however you want. See, I made some last night. I have some really pretty ones. A little one with a solar system on it. Yeah. So these are pretty fun to do. You could paint them. You could do some cool crafts with them. And they're just kind of fun to play with. Okay, great work, everybody. The next one we're gonna make is the rocket. And the rocket is really easy. So if you could do the hexagon, you're gonna do great with the rocket. So sheet of paper, and we're gonna fold the top down. And it doesn't matter how much you do. This is gonna be the top of your rocket. It's gonna be this little part right here. So the farther you fold it down, the taller your, your triangle on top of your rocket is. Okay, so we have this flap, great work. Now flip it over so that the flap is facing down. And then we're gonna fold the paper in half, hot dog style again. and then unfold it. So now you have a crease down the middle, your flap is on the back, facing down. Okay, now you're gonna do two equal folds. You're gonna bring your top right corner to the middle. Flatten it down, and you'll do the same thing on the left side. And okay, so mine's a little uneven, that's okay and you'll flatten it down. Great. All right, so now we have these little wings here. You're gonna fold in the, the sides of this shape. You're gonna fold them where that line is. See that? So you'll fold like this. You guys are doing awesome. We are almost done. Okay, so we're almost there with our rocket. We have one, one more thing to do and that's 
to get the, the booster packs on this rocket so that it can actually take off. So these folds you just made, you're gonna fold them back a little bit now, okay? So how much you fold them back is up to you. That'll be the width of your booster. Let's see, we'll fold back this way. And then on the front now, that's our booster pack. I'm gonna do it on the other side too. Okay. And when you flip it over, you've got your rocket. And you can have a lot of fun decorating this. I certainly did. <laughs> yeah, you can add some flames coming out the bottom. Give it a nice paint job. And maybe even combine it with your James Webb hexagons. Okay. So let's see. Um, I will now cancel that. Okay. Let's, rem <laughs> Christine, let's remove this. Oh, I got it. Remove the spotlight. Okay. So thank you all for participating. I hope you enjoyed. Um, oh yes, Melissa, we will, I'll drop the links in the chat in just one second. Um, before I do, I'm going to get um, our poll question going while our next speaker gets set up. Yes, I wanted to just uh, jump in here for just a second. Thank you, Andy and Grace. You guys did an awesome job. And everyone else, thank you for sharing your, uh, your screen with us. And if you want to share pictures or videos, remember of your completed origami artwork, Please make sure that if you're using the social media pages, we would love to hear from you. You can do that by tagging the at LPI today on Twitter and you also using the hashtag Beats, B-E-E-T-S. Um, you can share that again using your social media. So please make sure you're sharing your Argami artwork with us. Thank you, Grace. Let's proceed on with the next polls. Yeah, so in this poll, um, we just want to kind of get an idea of who we've got here. So we want to know if you've ever attended one of these programs before. We're so happy if you have and you're back to visit us. Um, or if you're new, that's fantastic. And um, we'd like to get an idea of who we have here. So if you're a student or an educator, parent, caregiver, just community member. And if there is not an option that best describes you, feel free to put that into the chat. We would like to get an idea of who is attending our events. So I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds and then we will end this poll. All right, thank you guys. And we can go to our next presenter. And I will put the links to these origami shapes in the chat right now. All right, so our next speaker, very good, Jimmy. Awesome, yep, I see you applying your rocket. <laughs> awesome, Jimmy, fantastic. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see our next speaker is gonna be our beloved manager. Her name is Christine Schupler. Christine is the manager of the education and public engagement team at the Luminary Planetary Institute. And she's gonna be telling us all about the stars and supernova. Christine. Thank you so much, Sherelle. Um, I also, I noticed that Dr. Mark Matney is here. I don't know if, if we heard, uh, Mark, would you care to go next? Or do you, I know you've got a very busy day or do you wanna hold on, your choice? No, I'm, I'm ready when you are, you tell me. Cause I, let's I, I need to get back now, in. Let's have you go now then. If you're ready okay. and waiting, let's have you start instead. I'll wait. All right, excellent, excellent. So I need to share, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. How to well, share let's screen. See. Do we, um, if that works. Do we wanna, let's give the audience an idea of who we've Oops. got joining us. Yeah, let, let me go ahead and do the introduction of Dr. Oops. Matney first. Okay. 
Awesome. So our speaker now, ladies and gentlemen, is not going to be Christine. She's going to present later. But now we have Dr. Matt Matney. And Mark is a planetary science at NASA's Johnson Space Center. And Dr. Matney is studying orbital debris like space junk. That can be mm -hmm. dangerous for the future missions. And Dr. Matney loves to share science. And today he is going to be telling us all about the infrared radiation. What is that? Mark, please <laughs> take it away. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you just fine. All right. I'm going to see if I can. Let's see if this works. Can you, can you see my screen? Yeah, we see yes, your desktop view right now. And you see my, see my, what is infrared? Do you see that? Mm -hmm. You just need to put it in presenter view and it'll be good to go. All right, let me figure out which button. There it is, this one. How's that look? Perfect. Or do I need to switch? Are you see just the one page? Uh huh. Yeah, this is the presented view. It looks great. Okay, perfect, perfect. So, so one of the questions, of course, is the James Webb telescope looks in something called infrared. And by the way, I remember as a boy reading about space and about radiation in space and seeing this word, I-N-F-R-A-R-E-D. And I thought it was spelled infrared. And so for the longest time, I would hear the word infrared and I would read the word infrared and I didn't make the connection. I finally realized it's infrared. So, so if you made the same mistake, don't feel bad because I did too. So, so to think about it for a second, we'll talk about what radiation is. We're all familiar with light. I mean, we turn on the light in the room when it's dark, we step out in the sunlight. Light is a form of radiation, which sounds awful. I mean, we heard radiation is a bad thing. Well, it can be, but it can also be very useful. Radiation is simply a way in which energy is transmitted from one place to another without interacting with anything in between. And the perfect example is the sun. The sun gives off light which travels through the vacuum of space. There's hardly anything in the vacuum of space. And then it arrives at the earth and that light is energetic enough that we can turn it into electricity, right? Or with a, with a solar panel or it can shine on plants and they can use it to do photosynthesis and make and grow. Or it can just warm things up on a summer day or even a winter day. So, um, so the radiation leaves, the energy leaves the sun, passes through empty space and arrives at the earth. And that's, that's just the word we call it for radiation. Now there's a light is this particular kind of radiation called electromagnetic radiation or EM. And electromagnetic radiation, again, sounds very scientific, but it's just, it's a, it's a, a type of radiation. It's very, very common. But what's interesting is you've seen a rainbow, I'm sure, the rainbow is, cut, is composed of you know, violet and blue and green and yellow and orange and red. Those are just different parts of the visible spectrum. We call it a spectrum and spectrum just means it's spread out into its different components. But it turns out that the light we can see is only a tiny, tiny slice of the entire infrared spectrum. And I found this wonderful chart here, which actually shows the James Webb telescope. But this spectrum goes all the way from very long wavelength radiation, which is radio waves. That's how you're, you tune, on, tune in your car radio. You're picking up radio waves, or actually your Wi-Fi system is radio waves. And then there's microwaves, which are a little higher energy. And we know about microwaves. We stick our food in our microwave oven and cook it and heat it up. And then there's the infrared, and then there's the visible spectrum. And then there's something called ultraviolet, what we'll come back to. And then there's x-rays. We know about x-rays. We go to the doctor if we break a bone and we take an x-ray to see if it's broken. And then there's very high energy radiation called gamma rays, but they're all basically the same thing, just different energies, different wavelengths. And as you can see there, the visible part of the spectrum is very, very narrow. Our eyes only see a very, very narrow window on the universe. And it turns out that the universe, things in the universe, radiate in all these different wavelengths. So for us to help us to understand the universe better, we'd like to have eyes, special kinds of eyes that can see in these other these other parts of the spectrum. And you can see there at the James Webb telescope there is in the what's called the infrared part of the spectrum. There was another smaller telescope called the Spitzer Space Telescope and it saw a little bit different part of the infrared. And we're all familiar with the Hubble Space Telescope. It pretty much saw in the visible range. And it turns out there are telescopes that astronomers use that see in the radio, 
that's seeing microwave, that's seeing ultraviolet, that's seeing x-rays, and that's seeing gamma rays. But, but James Webb is going to specifically look at the infrared part of the spectrum. And, and again, these are these parts, the, uh, these other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum are there. We just can't see them with our eyes. They're invisible to us. So one type that we're all familiar with is ultraviolet. And we've heard about ultraviolet, UV, UV radiation. That the ultraviolet means above violet, and it's a higher energy than 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 violet light. Uh, our skin is actually a crude UV sensor. If you go out on a summer day without sunscreen and go swimming, and you get sunburned, you become an ultraviolet detector, and that's of course not a good thing. You don't want to get sunburned. That's a bad thing, um, and that's exactly why we wear sunscreen on a summer day. If you go swimming, you don't want you want to block out those dangerous UV rays, the UV radiation from the sun, right? Infrared is on the other end of the visible spectrum. It means below red. That word infrared means below red. And we can sometimes and our skin can be used as a crude sensor for that as well. If you walk out today, I know here in here in Houston, it's an absolutely beautiful day. If you walk out, you immediately feel the heat of the sun on your skin. That's infrared radiation that you're feeling. That's the, rate, that's the heat radiation that's coming off of the sun, transit empty space, arriving at earth and warming up your skin. Also, if you've ever been camping and around a campfire, you could feel the warmth of the, of the campfire. That's the radiation coming off the campfire. So scientists have invented special instruments to see in those other EM bands. And I say see in quotes because it's not exactly seeing like our eyes. Nevertheless, it, it can look at those spectrums, at the, at the radiation on those spectra. And, and be able to see what's going on. And each type of EM radiation, each of those different parts, helps us see new things about our universe that we couldn't see any other way. So one of the neat things about IR, infrared, is they can help us map temperatures of distant objects in the universe, or close objects. You may have seen one of these devices before. It's called a contactless thermometer. And, and the doctor or your nur a nurse or your, or your mom or dad or someone, an adult, could point that at your forehead and take your temperature without even sticking the thermometer in your mouth. And it uses infrared. And I found this example at, the, at a NASA website. This is a thermal image of a puppy dog. And you can see that the, the bars on the right tell you the temperature. And so the brighter, the brighter colors there are warmer temperatures and the kind of purplish colors are cooler temperatures. But you can see how you can make a temperature map of that dog. It looks kind of weird in, in infrared, but, but it's, it's pretty amazing. One other thing is, is infrared can see at night, can see things, warm things at night. So that's another one. This is an example of a scientific use of infrared. This is an infrared detector looking at the moon Mimas. Uh, it's one of the moons of Saturn. And one of the things there on the upper left, it says expected temperature. That's what they expected to see on the temperature of Mimas. Here's what Mimas looks like. And here's what they actually saw. And so superposing, putting the two, the color over the, the map, you can see it was warm on this side of Mimas and cool on this side. So again, you can look and see things that you couldn't, just a photograph wouldn't tell you, but it tells you something about interesting things that are happening on, on Mimas in terms of where the temperature is, where the warm parts are. Another thing that IR radiation can do is it can sometimes penetrate barriers that block normal light. And uh, we'll get an example of that, I think, shortly. But a good example is the universe is filled with dust clouds, at least our galaxy is. And sometimes that du those dust clouds hide things behind them. But infrared can penetrate those dust clouds. This is an example from the Spitzer telescope. Here on the left is the infrared image of what's called the uh, Orion Nebula. This is what it looks like in visible light. And notice there's this, if you look at infrared, you see all kinds of structure here that's hidden in this picture because of those dark dust clouds. I don't know if you can see them there. And as a result, we can peer beyond, through those dust clouds and see structures that we couldn't see with just visible light. And here's another example down here. This is a galaxy named M82, the cigar, cigar galaxy. Here's what it looks like in visible. And notice in the infrared, there's all kinds of structure that we couldn't see with the regular image. So that'll be a really great tool. By the way, these are from the Spitzer telescope. The James Webb telescope is going to be much, much better than the Spitzer. So imagine images like this, only you can really zoom in and see all sorts of detailed structures. So it'll be really quite interesting when we can get, get James Webb up there taking pictures of the universe.
Oh, that's my last thing. And I, what I wanted to do was hand that off. I think Andy's ready. Is that right? He's going to give us a demonstration. Or has he already done that? No, I, I will head that way now. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, we'll turn it over to Andy to... Okay. Take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Matney. We appreciate it. All right, can you everybody hear me okay? Dr. Mm -hmm. Matney? Mm -hmm. Can you stop your screen share, please? Okay, I didn't know how to sh how to stop it. There we go. Did I stop it? Yes, thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Just fine, Andy. Great. All right. <clears throat> so I wanted to just uh, show you a demonstration uh, very similar to exactly what Dr. Matney was talking about in terms of uh, infrared. So um, let me just make sure I got everything going here. All right. Ooh, don't look at me. Okay. All right. So what I've got here, uh, well, I guess I should, can you, and you all can see that, right? It's just a, it's a black trash bag <laughs> uh, that, that my camera here uh, is looking at. Uh, and just using your eyes, you, you can't see anything behind it. The, the, that trash bag is blocking uh, what's in view. So just like in space, these cl clouds of gas and dust are very, very thick, and they block a lot of stuff that's behind the light from the things behind them that are trying to get through. But if we switch over and uh, view things in the infrared with an infrared camera, which I'm going to do. in just a second here. Okay, here we see a little ball or balloon shaped thing. Uh, we see different uh, temperatures with our scale bar. Uh, and what we're looking at back there actually turns out to be a light bulb. So I've got a lamp uh, just sitting right there behind um, the trash bag, which we couldn't see until we looked uh, through infrared using an infrared detector. So we see that heat, the infrared radiation coming off of the light bulb. Wow, Andy, that's cool. So we're looking through the trash bag and seeing that light bulb right now. Yes, but a, a more accurate way of saying it would be that the, the infrared radiation from the light bulb is coming through the trash bag mm -hmm. and into the camera on my phone. What would happen if, say, a, if a, it's a person walked back there? Uh, well, if somebody walked back there, I well, well, we could just do this, and there's my hand. Woo! <laughs> so, anyway, so uh, by the way, I don't have the special phone camera that's in my phone. It's an infrared camera that you can plug into your phone uh, that I'm using to get this image. Just, just to clarify. <laughs> Yes, okay. I knew that that was going to be someone's question. Just like, oh my goodness, you're using your phone? What app is that? <laughs> um, yeah, maybe Andy or Christine, can one of you put the name of that IR camera um, into the chat in case people are interested in sure. maybe purchasing one? There's, there's many different brands. We'll put the one that we've got, but there's many different versions. This one's called a Seek camera. Cool, cool. Well, I think next up we have a hands-on activity. <laughs> Yay, and our next speaker, go ahead. It's going to be um, our next speaker will be Christine Schubler. Oh, oh wait, no, are we going to do Grace is going to lead the activity, right? Grace, you're going to lead an activity? Uh, I or, think am I we're going to ask our host families to uh, please use their remote controls. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I got you. All right, so uh, host family, so I'm talking to Jimmy and Crystal. Do you guys have your remote controls? Awesome, this time you just need your remote control. Okay, I have mine as well, and I'm gonna be very careful of not dropping it in my um, uh, ice bath. All right, so with your um, remote control, what I want you to do first, I want you to find the portion or the top of your remote. 
And I actually want you to push without changing the, the channel or the volume on your TV, but I want you to push a button, the volume button up, and I just want you to look at the top of your remote control, okay? Um, where you, the place where you would normally point your remote control, like here, that's where I want you to look. I want you to push a button and look, and then tell me if you see anything. No? You, oh, Jimmy say you do see something? Okay, well, on mine, I see absolutely nothing. Now, what I want you to do now, I want you to point your remote control towards your camera, your camera that's on your computer. Go ahead and point it. And then I want you to see if you see my, if you see something now. You see my light flashing? We see a pink light flashing. What else do yeah. we see, folks? What else do we see? Yeah, okay. Now, Crystal, as you're looking down, though, do you see your light flashing when you look at it? She says she can. Jimmy, can you see your light flashing when you just look at it? Like that? Oh, I think y'all are cheating. I can't see mine, but I definitely see mine now when I point it to my camera. It depends on the remote. Like, I have my TV remote, and then I also have, I didn't bring it, but I have a little remote for, like, uh -huh. an electric fireplace. Yeah. And for the electric fireplace, when I push a button, a red light comes on. And I can see oh. that. But for my TV remote, when I look at it, nothing happens. But when I look at it through a camera, there's this like yeah. blue flashy light that I would not see. So yes. it's and Dr. Best. Magny, Ooh. right, Dr. Magny has participated as well. So Dr. Magny, we see your light flashing, but can you see it? No, when I look at it, I can't see it. Awesome. Success. Success. It. So, Dr. Matney, can you give us a little explanation of what's happening? Okay, it turns out that the little camera in your computer, it's sensitive a little bit to the infrared radiation. And, and the kinds of, of chip that, that's used in cameras like that can actually see the infrared radiation. And that's what's used to operate your television over there, operate my television over there long distance. And so the, 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 there's a detector on the television that can see the infrared signal. And, um, and of course, the thing is broadcasting an infrared signal, but my eye can't see it because my eye is not sensitive to it, but the camera on your computer is as well. So what we're actually seeing is the computer, the camera on the computer seeing the infrared radiation and it, it, it shows it as a different colored light, but it's a kind of a fake color because the computer doesn't know. It just sees the light from, it sees the infrared radiation from the, from the, from the uh, device here. And it interprets it as a color. But of course you can't see because your eye is not sensitive enough, at least in my case, in my detectors, my eye can't see those, those wavelengths of, of light, those parts of the spectrum. Cool, so when we're sitting on the couch changing the channel, we're sending out little infrared signals to our TV, and those are the same parts of the radiation spectrum that the James Webb is gonna look at. Exactly, and, there, and there's radiation like that coming from objects in space, but if I look at it with my eye, I can't see it, but James Webb will be able to see it. Thank you. That's pretty cool, that's pretty cool. Awesome. So um, I think we're ready to start tackling some of the things that are glowing in infrared and in other colors, right? Yay, let's, let's yay. do it. So Sherelle, thank you. You already introduced me. I'm Christine Shupla. I'm the uh, Education and Public Engagement Manager at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. And we're gonna talk just for a little bit about supernova. But um, before we do that, I think I had some questions for you too. Um, I think that we had a poll, let's see here, for you, for everyone. So I want to know from everyone here, have you ever seen a red star before? And for our host families, if you want to unmute yourself, Jimmy, Crystal, um, Jameson, if, if you all want to unmute yourself and tell us, when you go out at night and look at the stars, do you see different colors? Have you seen a red star before? What do you think? I'm not really sure. Not really sure. It's hard to tell sometimes. I've seen bright ones, but I don't think red. <laughs> right, maybe bright ones, but maybe not red ones. Sometimes it's really hard to tell their colors at night. Our eyes don't see colors very well in faint light. 
and stars are pretty faint compared to the sun and you know the moon and things. So um, so our eyes have trouble sometimes. But if you get practiced at it, you might see some stars are redder and some stars are bluer. And we're going to be talking a lot about red stars and, uh, specifically today. Um, so um, it looks like a lot of you say that, yes, you have seen a red star before, but some of you haven't, and at least one of you really isn't sure. Let's go ahead and let's do one more question um, right now. And my next question is, what is a supernova? Do you all know what a supernova is? Have you ever heard of a supernova before? Um, is it a type of car, a meteor, an exploding star, a galaxy, a giant sandwich? What is a supernova? <laughs> And do any of our host families want to hazard an answer? If you want to share your cameras and tell us what you think a supernova might be, you're welcome to. If you don't want to, that's okay too. I think it's an exploding star. You think it's an exploding star. And you know what? You are exactly right. And so are many of you said that it was an exploding star. Great job, guys. Now, um, one of you said it might be a type of galaxy. And there are galaxies out there that have exploding stars in them. And that's one of the reasons why these are so important. It's important for us to understand supernova for multiple reasons. And one of them is because when we see a really far away galaxy having a supernova, the supernova tells us not just about the star that exploded, but also a little bit about that galaxy and how far away it is. So um, let's go ahead and I am going to start sharing my screen. Um, Let's do that one right there. So um, let's talk a little bit about stars. Stars kind of have, they're not alive alive, but we say they have a lifetime. They change over time. They form and these giant clouds of gas and dust called nebulae, like the Orion Nebula. Um, and so uh, here in this picture, you can see some blue stars. Those blue stars are hot, young, massive stars, really big stars. And then you see little fingers of gas everywhere. And those hot giant blue stars, what they're doing is they're blowing away the gas with winds that are kind of eroding away the gas. And we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take a look. So massive stars, the really big ones, they, they have trouble holding on to themselves. Their, gra their gravity is strong, but they're also so big and bloated and they tend to go through phases where they become unstable and they start to blow away stuff. So here we're looking at, at a star in Carina and it is blowing away parts of itself. It's shedding parts of itself. Um, these really massive stars, the biggest ones, the most massive ones, the ones that have the most stuff in them, when they start off young, they're, they're blue because they're super hot, they're blue hot. Like the blue part of a flame is, is the hottest part. Blue stars are the hottest on the outside. And those blue stars, they're burning really hot. They're not really burning, but they're really hot because they have so much energy going on inside. Uh, the fusion is going on really fast inside. And as those stars get older, they become bloated. So if you've ever put a marshmallow in the microwave and, and microwaved, nuked a marshmallow, you've probably seen it get big, right? And if you take a really big marshmallow, a giant, they make them jumbo size now, right? If you take a jumbo size marshmallow and put it in the microwave, do this at home with your parents' permission, <laughs> put it in the microwave and watch it. It'll get really big. Well, those blue giant stars, they get really big. One of them is named Betelgeuse. You can also pronounce it Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse. And this star is in Orion the giant. It's in Orion's uh, left, upper left shoulder. So my left um, is right here, upper left shoulder. And um, this star is a red supergiant star. It is so big the, the diagram on the left there shows how big it is. If you put it where our sun was, it is so big that as they're going around it, Mercury would be inside of it and Venus would be inside of it and Earth would be inside of it. It goes out all the way to Mars goes out all the way to Mars and almost all the way to Jupiter, frankly, even all the way to Jupiter there. It's so big that the, the inside of our solar system would be inside of it if it was where our sun is. It's not where our sun is, so we're safe. Um, it's pretty far away. It's, it's, uh, and sometime in the next five to 10,000 years, it's going to explode because when stars are so massive, their cores 
um, eventually run out of, of what they're using for fuel. And the outside layers push down and squeeze them and they get hotter. And then they start a new form of fusion. They go through these different layers, but if they're massive enough, eventually that inner core runs out of ways to heat up and push out. And as it runs out of those ways to heat up and push out, the outside falls in, hits it really hard. And as it hits it really hard, it explodes out in something we call a supernova. And we're going to be doing an activity that we're calling supernova. And this activity has two parts. Um, so the first part is that core, that core when it runs out of energy, before it runs out of energy, it's pushing out, it's pushing this giant star and it's holding it up. It's holding it up really hard, really hard. Imagine, imagine something that's holding up something really heavy and it's really strong, but if it runs out of energy, if that thing that's holding it up runs out of energy, it's going to collapse. And so the first part of a supernova is that core collapsing. And Ms. Sherelle Webb is going to show us a part of the first part of her demonstration of the core collapsing. So I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, and my toolbar has disappeared as they tend to do. And thank you so much. Here you go, Sherelle. And so Sherelle, tell us what you've got there. You've got some ice. Yeah, so here I have a ice bag and I actually just uh, stepped away to put in some um, more ice in there. So it's just an ice bag. So it's really nice and cold. And then here I have a hot plate and there is not a specific temperature here, but I do have it on high and I definitely can feel the heat coming from it. It is really hot. So, so you've got a hot plate that's really, really hot. You've got an ice bath and I can see some cans there. Tell us about those cans. Okay, so this is hands down my favorite kind of water, which has nothing to do with this demonstration. <laughs> but I have some cans here that are going to uh, symbolize something. So here is basically symbolizing, symbolizing our star. Is that correct, Christine? It's symbolizing the core of that star. That the core, core of the of star. Mm -hmm. And then I also have some tongs here because I do not want to touch the cans because as you can see, they are on top of the hot plate and notice that they are upside down. Gotcha. So. I also have here my handy dandy goggles because I am going to be quickly moving over the core of our star, which is our can, into our cold bed of ice water. Gotcha, okay. So are we ready? We are ready. Everybody ready? Drum roll here. So. Okay, go ahead, Christine. Um, so everybody drum roll, we're ready. Um, we are going to implode a, a core of a star. We're gonna see what it's like where a star's core implodes. Do you guys think it's gonna get bigger or smaller? Bigger or smaller, everyone? Crystal okay, saying so, smaller, smaller. Yeah, I have four cans here just in case it doesn't work the first time because we know that it's, okay, ready? One, two, three. Ooh. Only a little, little bit. bit. It went a little bit, it shrunk a little bit. Let's try the next one. One, two, three, go. And it shrunk a little bit. Only a little bit. And actually, I'm gonna put that one back on because maybe it just needs to, I've been having them on here for the duration of our program so they can be really, really hot. But sometimes they don't work the first time. Nope. Shrunk a little bit. I'm gonna go back to this one. Nope. Okay, let's try the last one. Let's try the last one. And if not, I do have, we can try it again at the very end. Let's see. One, two, three. No. Nope. Okay. You could hear that one going. And Melissa says that she usually puts a little bit of water in the can and brings it to a boil. And that helps a little bit too. Yes, that I did that. And I think that's, um, may I just, you know, 
it was it's been on there for the duration of the program but we can try at the very end because i'm going to allow some water to go in there and flip it back over again but she's absolutely right you do want to let a little a few drops of water stay within the can because it gives you that effect that you are looking for so the effect that we're looking here for is a can that'll crumple up and another way uh, folks if you wanted to see sort of a demonstration of a can imploding under the weight of something. If you have a can and you have somebody wearing good shoes, who's talented, who can balance on the can just perfectly, then after they're done stepping on the can with one foot, if they tap the side of the can with the other foot, it'll crush. Oh, there we've got a good one. There's a great one. So that can imploded. So instead of exploding, it imploded. It shrank down. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So that is part one of our demonstration. So imagine this core of a star, of a really big star, and it implodes. Instead of being its massive size, the massive size of that core probably is something bigger than the earth. And it goes from being, that core goes from being the size of the earth down to being the size of a house. It gets shrunk really, really, really small. And then from then, the outer layers fall on top of it. And as those outer layers come rushing down on it, they hit it and they bounce off. And we're going to do a different activity that we're going to need crystal, we're going to need our host families for. So now here, and everybody who's participating at home, if you have two balls, you can do this too. You need two balls that bounce. So it can't be like a rock. A rock won't work for this. Has to be excellent. Two balls that bounce. Um, a tennis ball and a ping pong ball are great. Awesome, perfect. And I'm going to switch to another camera. So I'm gonna stop this video. Okay, folks, I am switching to another video and another camera here. And let's go ahead and let's spotlight this camera. Um, let's spotlight for everyone my camera here. Oops, sorry, you can see my feet. Um, so what we have here is we have a board and I am going to use a tennis ball and I'm going to use a ping pong ball. And the tennis ball here is representing that core. So everyone, one of your balls, the heavier one, the denser one, the ball that's denser is going to be one part. And then the lighter ball that's less dense is going to be the atmosphere. So this is the core. This is the atmosphere of the star. Now, normally, if you drop a ping pong ball, it bounces a little bit nicely, not too high though, right? And, and my tennis ball here is kind of a flat tennis ball, so it's not going to bounce very much at all, just a tiny bit. But what's happening here is that outer atmosphere of the star falls in and hits the core as the core is collapsing. So that combined energy is going to make it bounce higher. So what you need to do is you take your two balls, you put the atmosphere on top of the core, the denser core, you hold them together if you can. You can do it separately two-handed. Some people find it easier to do it one-handed. And as you drop them, you should see the atmosphere bounce really high. Let's have all of you try it. Let's have our host families try it too. Tell us how high it uh, goes and you're welcome to unmute your microphones and tell us what's happening here. Uh, whoop, mine just went about seven feet up in the air. Nice and high, nice and high. Tell us about it, Jimmy, did that, uh, how's it going? Did, did it go, did it go nice and high there? It did not go high at all. It did not go high at all. You can try it a couple more times. The ping pong ball should go, if it hits the tennis ball right, or you can also use a bouncy ball. Here, I've got a bouncy ball and a tennis ball. And I was experimenting earlier. Ooh, and the bouncy ball went quite nicely. But the best one I've found is if I use the bouncy ball as the core and I use the ping pong ball on top of the bouncy ball, then I can get it to jump up about 12 feet. So 
-hmm. How about everyone else? How is everyone else's uh, experiment going? Tell us a little bit about it. And while you're doing it, I'll switch back to my other camera. I tried doing this one too. It can be a little bit tricky, Jimmy. I'd say keep giving it a try because mm -hmm. the tennis ball and the ping pong ball have to um, have to hit at the same time. If they're falling one and then the other, it's not going to work. So they have to fall together, hit the ground, and then the ping pong ball is going to go pew, shoot Sometimes off. It, it takes multiple practices. Crystal, I'm watching you. Let's see how it goes. We can see your ball. You can see the ping pong ball and the tennis ball. Drop them and tell us what happens. Sometimes it takes multiple practices to get it to actually do what it needs to do. When it works right, it's a lot of fun. It's, it, yeah, yeah. It just takes practice. Um, yes, my small ping pong ball shot way off and the <laughs> heavier ball stayed in place for the most part. So it shot way up. So, so when those ping pong balls shoot way up, think of that as being the outer layers of that star and they are expanding at a hugely fast rate of speed, right? They're, they're just, and they're plowing into things around them. They're plowing into the, the gas that's around them and making that super hot. So there were questions here about um, the last supernova in our galaxy, we're overdue. We're, you, a galaxy, when we're looking at other galaxies out there, they tend to have a supernova about every 100, 200 years or so from what we can tell looking at other galaxies. And we haven't had one in our galaxy in several hundred years. So we're overdue. Um, there was a famous one in our galaxy that people all over the world saw um, back a thousand years ago, and they took records of it. And it's in the constellation known as the Crab, uh, at, at, uh, Taurus the Bull, and it's the Crab Nebula. Later when we looked at it, we've been able to see it. Um, so why is this important? Well, first of all, it's important to understand how these massive stars explode. Um, it helps us understand a lot about stars and how they change over time and how they create new elements that are scattered then throughout the galaxies. Um, but also we can use these supernova explosions because they're so bright. We can use them to help us figure out how far away other galaxies are. And so when um, the, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be looking at some really, really far away galaxies, some of the earliest ones. Um, we're going to be monitoring them for things like supernova explosions that for a month or so make a spot in that galaxy as bright. A, a supernova can, make, can be the same brightness as the entire galaxy for a while, for a few days to a couple of months. And so um, we're going to be looking at that to try to figure out how far away these galaxies are in part and help us understand a little bit more about our universe's expansion. So um, there were questions, uh, comments I see in the chat about, there was a very famous supernova that happened in 1987 in a small galaxy near our galaxy. Um, so in the, lar in the Ma Large Magellanic Cloud, um, and I remember that I was in college at the time and people were racing down to the Southern Hemisphere to observe it because it was really cool. Um, so anyway, um, let's see, do we have some more polls, Grace? I think that's, and if people have other questions or comments about supernovas, I'm happy to answer them. Um, uh, Mark, if you're still with us, there was a question for you about anything in particular that you're looking most forward to to seeing from the James Webb Space Telescope? Is there something that you're excited and can't wait to see? That's actually a good question. I really like to see the Orion Nebula because we've, at, at very high resolution, because we've seen it with the Hubble and seen all sorts of interesting structures. For instance, there's these things called proplids, which are balls of gas, they're protoplanetary disks, and there's stars forming inside of them. And I, I'm hoping that the uh, in the infrared will be able to peer inside those protoplanetary disks and see the planets actually forming. I don't know. We'll we'll see what we can see, but it'll be interesting to see that same high resolution imagery of the Orion Nebula in the infrared and see what it looks like. Absolutely, and we're hoping that it'll also help us learn more about uh, planets going around other stars and how they form and how they change. So that'll be really exciting as well. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Sherelle and Grace, I'm going to hand it back to you. I have one more fun poll question for you guys, and then we'll start right. to wrap things up. This one is just sort of a fun trivia fact. So we'll test your knowledge. And we want to know, so did you know the mirrors on the James Webb Space Telescope are made, well, they're coated in real gold. That's why they've got that really pretty yellowish orange color. How much gold do you think was used? About 50 grams, that's like the weight of a golf ball. 100 grams, the weight of a big apple. 500 grams, that's like a pint of ice cream. Or 5,000 grams, like a bag of potatoes. So how much gold was used to cover the mirrors of this really big telescope? It's a big telescope, they're really big mirrors. What do you think? And I'm going to ask Dr. Matney, why did they, the engineers choose to go with gold as a coating? I think Walter talked a little bit about the, the gold choice in our, right. our Today's program is for kids and on Thursday we had one for adults and he talked a little bit about the choice for gold. Um, Grace, do you? It, well, it, really high quality astronomical mirrors for light, for the light that we can see with our eyes, they use silver because silver is very, very reflective in, visible, in the visible part of the spectrum. And it just so happens that gold is very, very reflective in the infrared parts of the spectrum. So it looks yellow to us because not all of the light is reflecting back to our eyes. But when you get into the infrared, it's actually very efficient at reflecting. I won't say it looks silver in, in infrared because colors have no meaning outside of what we can see. But it's very, very reflective. And the other thing is you can you can put gold very, very thin on the materials. But I think they, they deposit it with a, a gold plasma. So it's a very, very thin layer of gold which is probably why the answer in your poll is very, very small number. What's the answer? That's right. So the answer is the first option, 50 grams, about the weight of a golf ball, is what was used to cover all 18 mirrors on the James Webb. So you're right. It was a very efficient process of spreading out a thin gold coat, um, which is really amazing. So much incredible say, that's incredible it, yeah it really <laughs> is but so the james Webb, of course was uh it's not in space yet but under production for a long time very expensive and um but it wasn't because of the gold <laughs> only a little bit for that right. whole spacecraft it's the, te um, the technology of the of the telescope that that's made it that's made it so difficult to build yes and hopefully you all are excited about the James Webb after today's program. We're going to have future programs about this telescope. There's a lot of excitement in the field right now. So other organizations are doing educational and informative programs about the telescope. Um, and look forward to the launch. It is happening on December 18th. That is the current scheduled date. It could get moved around, but probably December 18th. It's launching from South America, so don't make any plans to go to Florida to see the launch. It won't be happening there. Um, but start to get excited. Mark your calendars. Follow the news of the launch of the James Webb. All right, so I'm going to let Sherelle wrap up the program. We have a couple of final evaluation polls um, before you guys all run off. So um, actually, let, I guess let me go ahead and get those launched. Oops, I'll stop sharing that. All right. So thank you all for your participation, um, for sticking around. We can keep uh, asking questions if you, or answering questions if you have them, but we would really love it if we could get your feedback through these three poll questions. So we wanna know what you'd like to learn more about with our future programs. You can select more than one option. We'd like to know what was your favorite part or something that you liked about today's program. And again, you can select multiple options. And then finally, if you're interested in see receiving any email notifications from LPI and what 
would be interesting for you to receive. So this is a long poll, lots of options. So I'll just give you a couple minutes to answer. Um, but you can be thinking about if you have any more questions for any of our speakers. And as always, if you missed anything, you can go find this recording on YouTube and you can watch it there or any of our previous programs to learn about the moon or Mars. We've had some really great ones and we'll have future ones coming soon. Absolutely. And also, while we are having some people to stay around, if they still have q and I, I have two. I've taken Melissa on her advice and I've dropped some teaspoons of water inside of the can. So we're going to see if that works. So that's going to be the final goal to this demonstration. <laughs> if you want to stick around to see it. All right. Well, I'm going to close the poll. And uh, now we'll close it now. That's good. Thank you all. And if you're heading out now, there's a survey that you'll be sent to after you leave the Zoom. Totally optional, but we would love any feedback that you do have. Additionally, the links to the activities that we did today are listed in the survey. So if you want to find the link for the origami or the remote controls or the the ball bounce or the crush can, any of that, it's in the survey. So you can find it there even if you don't want to do the survey. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to stop. Sherelle. We should also thank our host families for joining us. Yeah. Let's go. I'm sorry, Christine, I didn't hear you. I, um, I just, I'm so delighted that everybody joined us, um, in particular Dr. Matney and our host families. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. One final go to our imploding can. And I've taken Melissa on her advice with putting the liquid inside. And as you can see, I actually had success off camera, but you guys didn't see that. Of course, it's not going to work. Then let's go. Five, four, three, two, one. There we go. Everyone saw that? I mean, Ooh, I have that one good. more just in case there's a repeat. So one, two, three. See that? It worked. It was a success. Awesome implosions there. Awesome. Awesome. So ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you. Let me stop that share. Awesome. As always, we always want to make sure that we are thanking our all of our presenters, Christine, Andy, Dr. Magny, and Grace, thank you all for delivering some fantastic information to our audience today. We want to thank you all for just spending some time with the Lunar and Planetary Institute today. As Grace has mentioned, um, if you have any questions about uh, any of the activities that we've done, um, those things are not only in the checks, but they are going to be in the survey that follows. Do I have anyone with some last and final words before? We send our guests off today. And most importantly, we want to th thank our host families. If you're ever interested in becoming a host family for one of our virtual programs for VEATS, all you have to do is email us at education at lpi.usra.edu, and we'll be happy for you to join us to show your cameras, to show your enthusiasm. So long, everyone, and you have a fantastic Saturday evening. Bye. Bye, Sherelle. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Manny. Fantastic job. There was one question. Should I answer that here? Uh, Martin had a question about rockets. Oh, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Absolutely. So Martin yeah. asked, if you, mm -hmm. if you look up there, he asked, where was that? Oh, why are rockets being launched near to the equator? That's actually a really, really good question. Martin, are you still on? So we can hear the answer. I don't know if he's still on, but I'll answer for everyone else. So it turns out that the reason why people like to launch near the equator is you actually get the motion of the Earth's rotation in there. And you get a little extra slingshot effect the closer you are to the equator because the Earth is rotating and you get a little extra from the from the uh, from the rotation of the Earth. So that, that's why we like to launch near the equator. You need a little bit less rocket to get the same amount of mass up into space. Yeah, that's all, and it's a it's a big rocket, right? <laughs> it is. It's and it's launched uh, from French Guiana. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Yes. Yes. The what? It's the European Space Agency has a uh, a launch um, 
facility, I suppose, a launch facility yes. in French yes. Guiana at the, the northern part of South America, right near the equator. Right. Okay. Yeah, in Peru, that's right. It's in, it's in the, a place called Peru. And it's just a little bit north of the equator. So it's an ideal place to launch at least certain kinds of rockets. And, uh, that it, and, and even in the United States, we like to launch ours from Florida, which is pretty far south. Yeah, about as south as you can go. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to stop the um, the streams now.